Hey guys, what's up? Welcome to my massive, massive Hidden Gems compilation. I'm gonna show you a lot of games here from all different genres and of course including the RPGs. So let's begin! Saga Scarlet Grace Originally released on the PS Vita, this is an enhanced port of it for modern consoles. Digital only so far. Like most Saga games, it has non-linear gameplay and no experience points. You select between four playable characters after a series of questions, and off you go in a world where a powerful empire has been dissolved. Every character has a different objective, but the overall plot revolves around the Firebringer, previously defeated in the war, attempting to come back. I said the gameplay isn't linear because it's a small open world where you can do quests at your own pace, or you can just ignore them and focus on the main quest if you want to. Combat is played in turns but with a twist. Everyone shares an AP bar and each individual action costs AP, so you can only select one attack per three characters or two or four, etc. That's where the strategy in this game comes from, knowing which attacks to use against what and which character to perform them. Like I said, you don't level up. Instead, Characters increase random stats after each battle. Older Saga games I feel you needed a guide to play them. This one I feel you'll be fine without one. Give it a try if you're already a fan and if you're not, well, this one might be a good entry into the series. Transistor Transistor is a pretty unique game developed by the same company who made Bastion and Hades. You play as Red and her talking sword, who will narrate the entire adventure. You know and understand nothing of them and their situation, but little by little you will start to comprehend what the hell is going on. The game plays in an isometric view, with Red fighting against several types of robotic enemies. Abilities are assigned to each button, and you learn several of them. This plays a major role here because instead of losing a life, whenever you die, you'll temporarily lose one of these abilities. Lose all four that you assign for the battle, and the game will be over. Battles are real-time, but you can freeze the game to strategically plan the order of your attacks and the positioning of your character. It takes a while to get used to this battle system, but the game's fairly balanced, so it's not that bad. Nightshade Believe it or not, this is a spin-off of the popular Shinobi series. It was released back in 2003 and it's still an exclusive on the PS2. It's also a sequel to that Shinobi game which is also on the PS2. Developed by Overworks, now basically one of the many Sega divisions, it's a hack-and-slash game that plays very similar to Shinobi, but with a female protagonist named Hibana and a much faster gameplay. The goal of the game is to have Hibana eliminate the evil bastards from the evil Nakatomi Corporation. That and also to find some shards from a cursed sword. Missions are pretty linear most of the time, having you defeating the enemies and fighting a boss at the end. Sounds repetitive, but hack and slash games are always like this, aren't they? I first met Hibana when she appeared in Project Cross Zone 2, a gigantic crossover that I love on the 3DS. Unfortunately, Nightshade on the PS2 has become somewhat rare and expensive, costing almost what a new modern game costs. Super Valleys 4 The fourth and final entry in this very niche series before the trademark became uh, an adult visual novel. Anyway, previous games were released in North America for the Genesis and the TurboGrafx CD, although in Japan they were released also on several computer systems. For this game, however, the PC Engine version stayed in Japan and we only got the Super Nintendo release. Europe never got any of them. It's a side-scroller action game where you control the heroine Lina. She can run, jump and crouch, but only attack in one direction with her sword. By pressing up and the attack button, she can also shoot a magic bullet. You will find other projectile weapons that you can select with the triggers, and some will obviously be very useful against the bosses. It's a pretty challenging game, despite being beatable in about an hour or so. Story takes place 15 years after Valleys 3, and all games are connected, that's right. So it will take me a long time to explain it. If you care about it that much, definitely give the others a try. Legrand Legacy 
This is a turn-based RPG developed by indie studio Semisoft, right in the middle of a civil war, an amnesiac protagonist with strange powers named Finn travels the land. His quest is to recover his memory and understand his powers, though he ends up being caught up in the war. For an indie game, this has great graphics, neat character design and good interface. The battle system plays in terms but with a touch of quick time. You need to press the right button at the right time to make your attacks work better. Because of this feature, this game has been compared a lot to The Legend of Dragoon. Check this one out if you can, it's often on sale and it's pretty damn decent. Bomberman Tournament I know it's hard to believe there's a Bomberman game with strong RPG elements, but trust me, it's real. And it's good. Obviously, you play as Bomberman in this quest-driven game, where your goal is to find Carabons to train them for the tournament. You will enter towns to gather information and side quests that will take you to the overworld. In these top-down view areas, the gameplay will be like a classic Bomberman. You need to position your bombs to defeat the enemies and carve your way through. The Carabons part is very similar to Pokémon, as you will acquire them in order to train them. The purpose is to have them fight in these one-on-one -on -one battles. Here you will select the three actions your creature will execute. Then the combat will begin on turns, but you won't have any control. It's weird and it relies a lot on luck and strategy. However, once you start learning the patterns and the weaknesses of your enemies, it'll be more fun. Overall, Bomberman Tournament is a neat action-adventure game worth checking out for its charm and uniqueness. Fragile Dreams – Farewell, Ruins of the Moon Here's yet another original game, but one that's extremely unique and hard to label. It's basically a cross-genre, but in the end, it's just an adventure game by Core by Kentaro Kawashima from Tree Crescendo. With beautiful colors and music, Fragile Dreams is yet another post-apocalyptic story you take control of Seto, whose grandfather has recently passed away. After reading a letter from him that tells him to go to a tower where he'll find survivors, Seto's journey begins. He finds this weird girl who seems to be connected with the origins of the ruined Tokyo, therefore these two becomes part of his endeavor. Because of its survival horror elements, you'll barely be able to see anything on certain areas, but that's made on purpose to make you look for clues. Seto will also find a machine that will help him on his quest, unlocking clues and, well, just making conversation. Here you'll have to go around with a flashlight and fight ghosts. This is where the motion controls come in, as you need to aim with the Wiimote at the screen so you can efficiently hurt some of them. Why? Because the light makes them vulnerable. You will gain experience points by fighting all types of enemies. Now, since Fragile Dreams is a highly unique game, it's hard to explain how the boss battles will be as every one of them has very different requirements. In the end though, it's not exactly a role-playing game, but its elements are there to give the gameplay even more variety. Trapped Trapped is part of the Deception series, some bizarre but also unique games that started back on the PlayStation. The first one was an action RPG in first person where the goal was to set traps to kill your enemies. The others were in third person but the RPG banner was gone. Trapped was the only one released on the PlayStation 2 and it acts more like a spin-off than anything. You take control of Princess Alicia, translated as Allura for whatever reason. She and her retainer Rachel escape the castle when somebody kills the king. Her stepmother, the Queen Catalina, frames her from this to make matters worse. Rachel and Alicia arrive in a mansion for safe heaven, which is where most of the game will take place. Upon forming a pact with the mysterious entity, Alicia acquires the power of using traps. So the game revolves around you running around the different rooms of the mansion while positioning your traps to stop and kill your enemies. Where you put them and how you use them will have to vary depending on the type of foe you will face. Or you can just stick with the usual set of three traps if you feel more comfortable. So your strategies influence how much points and money you'll get, which act a little bit like an experience system. Especially since that's how you acquire new traps and their respective upgrades. Trapped is quite the hidden gem, 
definitely if you want to try something completely different from any type of game whatsoever. The Legend of Valkyrie This one is a classic arcade game that remained in Japan for quite some time until its inclusion on Namco Museum Vol. 5 on the PlayStation. There was also a port on the PC Engine, but once again, only in Japan! You play as Valkyrie in a quest to defeat the evil lord in order to bring peace back to Marvel Land. You might recognize her as she is one of the many playable characters in Namco Cross Capcom and the Project Cross Zone games. Also, this game is a sequel to another only in Japan game that, well, it's not very good in my opinion. A top-down view perspective awaits you as you control Valkyrie fighting enemies with her different magics. These are bound to her sword and can be either obtained randomly or purchased from the shop you'll see several times throughout the game. Because of this, it might feel a little bit like a shoot 'em up of some sorts. Often you will encounter characters that will give you clues or magic spells. The sense of exploration is what also gives the game some RPG elements. You see, depending on how you explore, you might find useful stuff or money. For so to say, it plays similarly to the first Legend of Zelda game. If you can't get your hands on the PS1 port, try the TurboGrafx Mini, where the game was also released. Or you can just emulate the many versions of it just to see the differences. I personally recommend the other two though, since they're the best out there to play, in my opinion. Caladrius Blaze Caladrius or Caladrius, whatever it is pronounced, is a vertical shoot 'em up with heavy fan service and a story driven adventure. It was first released digitally on the Xbox 360 and later ported to the PS3, but that version stayed in Japan. That is until its re release on the PS4, Switch, and PC a few years ago. The point of the game is to play as any of the many playable characters and complete their arcs. I beat it with three characters and didn't see much change, so I'm not sure what happens if you finish it with all. Controls are amazingly responsive, as are the triggers, the weapon switching, and the bombs. It's honestly everything you want in a shoot 'em up. However, there's a lot of eroge here, since every time your character gets hit, your clothes get ripped off. Same applies for your enemies, but only if they get a major hit. The music, like in most shoot 'em ups, is masterful. So overall, it's a fantastic game and a great combination of ecchi and shooter. Blade Strangers Blade Strangers is a crossover fighting game featuring many characters from indie titles or games published by Nicholas, most notably Shovel Knight and Cave Story. It even has the guy from The Binding of Isaac, so for that reason it should be more popular, but I guess including several characters from pretty much hidden gems that no one knows about makes it obscure. Hell, it's got Solange from Code of Princess. It's an incredibly well done 2D fighting game available also on PC and the Switch. It's more of a combo based fighter where you can create several attacks in a row by pressing just a few buttons. I love these types of fighting games as I'm usually bad at technical fighters like Tekken for example. This is a great game and one of my favorites of the genre in this generation. I don't think it has the recognition it deserves. Puppeteer Another one that got expensive during Covid is Puppeteer, exclusive to the PS3, by the way. It's a beautiful platformer in both 2D and 3D at the same time that's also very unique. It plays as if you were watching a puppet show in a theater with weird and over-the-top character designs. You can play this game by yourself or with someone else in local co-op, because you control Kutaro, a boy that's been transformed into a headless puppet, but also a companion that will serve to interact with certain unreachable objects. Kutaro can equip up to three different heads that serve different purposes, and fight with giant scissors to cut down his path to next stages and bosses. Other accessories will be unlocked as you progress, like a grapple and a shield. There's more to it than it appears, it's just full of very carefully designed details. Definitely one of the most unique games released on the PS3. Divinity 2 
This one was released only on PC and the 360. It's part of the Divinity series, but no one knows it because they all know the original scene games. Well, this one predates it. There are two versions on the 360, Vanilla, which is Ego Draconis, and the update with the expansion pack called The Night Saga. It's an action RPG with a customizable character where you'll train as a dragon slayer. After your training, you'll be sent into the world to take on quests often related to dragons. And speaking about them, you can also become one and do these aerial missions with shooting elements. Be careful what you say or do as your choices can greatly influence the story and dialogues. All in all, it's a pretty solid game buried under the success of the original scene games. Give it a chance if you see it out there. Operation Logic Bomb this one is a top-down view action game where you'll control an agent called Logan. You start with only two types of ammo, the regular machine gun and the spread. As you make progress, you'll get more types of ammo and some can be used to solve puzzles or defeat certain enemies easier. In fact, the game can be very hard if you don't know what's the best ammo for them. But fortunately, you get four continues. The story is really hard to follow as all you do occasionally is find these terminals where you seem to get visions from the past. Apparently, Logan is sent to avoid a dimensional catastrophe because all contact with a bunch of scientists was lost. The game has great controls, nice interface and pretty much great gameplay, but like many Jellico games, it didn't get a lot of marketing out there. It's also on the Switch emulator, by the way. Chaos Legion so this game was made by Capcom in an attempt to create something similar to Devil May Cry, but with RPG elements. It's a hack and slash alright, but not as fast paced as most of those games. This one is rather technical, as it revolves around the main character having the ability to control summons called legions. Each one of them will play differently with their abilities and skills. They will gain experience and improve the more you fight and complete missions. It plays somewhat like Castlevania Curse of Darkness, now that I think about it. Also, this is yet another twisted and dark as hell story. It doesn't focus too much on it, but it somehow feels very powerful and present. This is an amazing game. Nevertheless, just like Haunted, I do believe it can be an acquired test as well, since it's very hard and not too friendly with newcomers. If you give it a few tries though and endure, I can at least vouch for it becoming a rather unique experience. Valkyrie Drive, Bikuni. Okay, well, I know, it's a fan service game. But I'm a sucker for beat em ups, and I'll always play them at least once no matter what. It's not your classic 2D beat em up, though, as it plays fully in 3D. But the button mashing, the fast paced action, and the crazy fun is all there, man. I mean, these girls could be dudes or creatures or whatever for all I care, and I will still be here recommending it. In this game though, besides the strong sexualization content that I won't cover because YouTube, you know, you'll be reading a lot of dialogue, almost like a visual novel. Yes, it's a dumb story, but it gets surprisingly interesting with even some political views. There's almost zero customization or equipment upgrades, but your girls do level up, and trust me, this is a hard game that even on easy mode can get very challenging. Therefore, sometimes you'll need to grind in order to increase your level and have better chances. Valkyrie Drive is a great beat em up, but yeah, I guess it's only for people who enjoy the huge fan service or can at least tolerate it. Hunted the Demon's Forge. Let me say this right off the bat. This game is an acquired taste. It didn't do very well in the reviews and it certainly got a mixed reception from gamers. Why? Because it's just too difficult and controls can be quite clunky depending on the type of equipment you have. And while I certainly agree with the criticism, I somehow set aside its unpleasant moments and managed to beat it and enjoy it. Haunted is an action game where you control two characters. Sometimes you'll need to switch between them both, but you can play almost the entire adventure with just one. The dude can equip heavy armor and weapons while the girl does the standard swords and bow. 
It's not an RPG because its major focus is on the mission after mission playstyle, hovering over 10 or 12 hours, but the elements are there, clearly visible, as characters level up, upgrade equipment and learn several different skills. This is a very dark game, but with a strong sense of humor and notorious fan service. So there's also some boost to its linear story. Like I said before, it's an acquired taste and I strongly recommend it to people looking for a good challenge. Aquapata. Aquapata or Aquapasa, whatever, is a 2D fighting game originally released for the arcades in Japan. A North American port was released for the PlayStation 3, meaning it's basically an exclusive to it. And it actually is a crossover from many games developed by companies Aqua Plus and Leaf, most notably the Uta Wareru Mono series and the original Tears to Tiara. Several characters are there to choose from and you can also select a partner that you can summon for certain moves. However, this isn't a combo-based game per se. Sure, there are combos to be done by button mashing your controller, but it's also somewhat technical. You know, like the Street Fighter games where you gotta pull out some moves and supers? Overall, it's an excellent game that greatly combines those two fighting modes really well. Thunder Spirits This game is actually Thunder Force 3, released on the arcade and the Sega Genesis. The arcade version was then ported to the Super Nintendo, but for some reason they changed the name to Thunder Spirits, hence why most people don't even know it's the same game as the one on the Genesis. Like many other horizontal shoot 'em ups the graphics are excellent, the music is badass and the sprites are beautiful. You can choose at the beginning which planet you'll play through first, the order however doesn't really matter. Several weapons are available to use, like the claws for example, which were there in the previous Thunder Force games. However, dying means you'll lose that weapon so you need to be careful. As you may have imagined, the game's quite challenging, but you can change the difficulty if you feel it's too hard. Great game here and very underrated. If you know why they changed the name for the SNES release, let us know in the comments. Horizon Chase Turbo I'm not really into racing games, but if I had to choose one of the very few that I like is this one. It's a Brazilian game inspired by the classics OutRun or Top Gear, released on PS4, Xbox One, Switch and modern computer systems. I obviously played the PS4 version, a game I gifted to my buddy Oscar. He loved the game and I clearly saw why. The graphics look absolutely beautiful and the stages are very different each time. The controls are also superb. I usually suck balls at racing games, but I managed to get into this one quite easily. I'm not sure why this game isn't more rated and well known, could be for many different reasons that I disagree with. It's excellent and I strongly believe it needs more attention. Spectral Force 3 Another exclusive on the 360 is this very obscure game from a very obscure series. They're all connected and take place in the same universe, but there's no need to play one to understand the other. Each has their own cast of characters, fighting in the never-ending war between several kingdoms, empires and races. In this third entry you play as a group of mercenaries and eventually you must choose an army to fight for. Doing so changes the route, the ending and the extra party members you'll recruit. Combat revolves around grid-based maps with the usual spectral combos for your characters, although other features come from regular strategy RPGs. It's hard like all the other games in this series, which means it's also pretty grindy, but I found this one to be the easiest of them all. Great game here, if you like tactical RPGs this is a must play if you own a 360. Croilor Sigma I probably pronounced the first word wrong, but anyway, this is a hack and slash game with four playable characters, but you gotta beat an entire mission with the first heroine to unlock the next one and so on. 
Missions are quite long and you can't save in between. They're pretty simple though, you beat a bunch of enemies, then move on to the next floor, etc. Until you beat a major boss. The girls can equip four different swords, each attached to an action button. You'll find these swords randomly by defeating enemies. The game has good controls, but it's all about abusing the dash button and the sword skills, because the regular ones are kinda lame. You also level up the more you fight. Sometimes two girls can fight together at the same time, but you can only control one. There's dialogue in here, but fortunately not that much, keeping it silly but simple. This is a really fun game to play every now and then, check it out! Guilty Gear Judgment Another PSP release from a famous franchise that didn't get enough love is this game. It's a spin-off, but it's not a fighting game. Instead, it's a side-scrolling beat-em-up starring characters from the series. At the beginning you can only choose five of them, but as you complete the game others will be unlocked. Controls are great and very responsive here, although faster and different from most beat-em-ups out there. The thing is, controls are actually based on the fighting games, which means you'll probably experience the adventure as if you were playing one. Several stages await every single character, but they're all the same including the bosses no matter which one you choose. I'd stick with one and beat the game with it. Just keep in mind that they all control completely different to one another, as in a regular Guilty Gear game. I really enjoyed this little spin-off and I fell in love with its soundtrack. Oh my god, it rocked my ass off! What's even more awesome is that this version includes Guilty Gear X2 fully playable with PSP graphics. So how can one kick-ass beat-em-up that includes another full game be so underrated? Probably because the main title is a spin-off most people didn't get to play. Sexies. I don't think it's a surprise to many that this highly obscure game is my number one, it's something I've mentioned a few times in both of my channels. Actually, this was one of the very last NES games I played before I moved on to the Super Nintendo. It's a science fiction side-scroller that has several gameplay styles. The first stage will always be a regular platformer, where you'll need to find a secret door to take down a boss, by doing so you'll unlock the next area. More platforming, but with more puzzles will be there, but always inside a base. These bases will also include small horizontal shoot-em-up parts, where you'll need to enter into the right door to move on. The secondary stages will always be shoot-em-up missions again, but mostly in outside areas. These can be pretty tough and hard to control as they aren't greatly designed. I still like them though. And then you'll face the boss at the top of a small moving platform. I really love every single boss fight as they all look epic, cool and interesting. The music stands out beautifully in this game, even though you only have like 4 or 5 themes looping all over the place. I love Sexies and I wish more people got to know it and play it, even though I have to admit it's very hard and not really for everyone. But it's still my favorite video game on the NES. Decap Attack. This is a game that usually comes in a lot of collections, a lot of Sega Genesis collections. The version I played comes on the PS4 uh, Sega Genesis collection, and it's a side-scroller platformer uh, adventure game that's very weird, obviously, because you control this headless guy, this headless creature, hence the name Decap Attack, and you use your head to attack and you jump and all that jazz. But the thing is that the game, that the, it controls very in a very slippery manner, I mean, it's hard to control the character, but that's the whole point of the game, to make her even crazier, to make the gameplay crazier, as crazy as its ideas, as its enemies, as everything else. And um, this is a game that's part of a series. Many people don't know this series because, number one, it's, very, it's a very obscure series of very obscure games. But um, you may have heard of a game called Kid Cool, which uh, the AVGN trashed a long time ago. It's a bad game. Well, the other two games are good, which are Decap Attack, and there's this Fox game, I forget the name. Uh, Decap Attack is very good, it's very challenging, and it has a little bit of Metroidvania feels, because you 
it's not just run from one from point A to point B. You gotta find certain things and certain items to progress with the game. Uh, even if you beat the boss, if you didn't find these items or if you didn't didn't do this or that, you know, you, you still gotta do it before you can reach the next level. And this is a game that stands out like crazy because of the music. My God, what an amazing soundtrack! It's very good, great game, just very challenging, hard to control, and well, you just get you play the game if you're in a crazy mood. That's pretty much it. Kowloon High School Chronicle This is a remake of a PS2 game that never came out of Japan. It got a physical release in Europe by P-Cube, but remember that your Switch is region free. Kowloon is by far the most unique dungeon crawler in first person I've ever played, but it's also more of a visual novel than anything, although there's tons of decision making. Like every 5 seconds you gotta choose a reaction to all conversations, which is something that keeps you entertained. After all, the story is very interesting about a transfer student in the middle of several paranormal events happening at his high school, so it gets pretty dark every now and then. Obviously, your reactions and choices affect your relationships with all characters you meet. Some of them will join you on several investigations during night at the cemetery. That's your dungeon crawling in first person in large areas full of many different puzzles. Battles are played in turns and you can use a variety of projectiles and weapons, but you have to aim at the enemies to attack them. You can have your allies do something to aid you in battle as well. Overall, it's a great game full of personality and originality. I strongly suggest you check it out if what I described sounds like your kind of jam. Dengeki Bunko Fighting Climax Released in Japan on the arcades and later port to the PS Vita and PS3. And it's yet another crossover, inviting characters from light novels, games and anime series, like for example, Durarara and Sword Art Online. It also features characters from Virtua Fighter and Valkyria Chronicles, but you gotta unlock them first. A wide variety of fighters you can choose from and also with an assist partner that can be summoned to make a move during battle. This one is heavily based on combos, so it's all about mashing your buttons to beat the crap out of everyone. It has great controls and it feels awesome to fight any contestant. It also got an updated version called Ignition, but that one stayed in Japan. This vanilla one, however, is a masterpiece and a must play if you're into 2D fighters. Advanced Guardian Heroes Remember that cold classic game on the Sega Saturn? Well, this is its sequel on the Game Boy Advance. Here you choose a customized warrior to fight the heroes from the previous game to earn their powers. It's basically a beat em up with RPG elements, and those revolve around leveling up after each mission. You will be able to distribute points on the status of your character, of course, so depending on them he will perform differently with each type of attack. It's all into building the combos though, even jumping around and kicking about. The controls are surprisingly decent considering the GBA wasn't exactly great for action games. It can feel very technical at times but also satisfying to beat the crap out of your enemies. However, some of them will require different means for you to destroy them, sometimes involving the use of magic. I gotta admit, it's a very good follow-up to the classic on the Saturn, which also influenced the action RPG on the 3DS and Switch called Code of Princess. After all, that game was made by Remnants of the development team behind these two amazing games. Neo Geo Heroes Ultimate Shooting I bet you didn't know this one existed, huh? It's a pretty solid crossover if you like SNK like me. It's a vertical shoot 'em up with various characters from the King of Fighters series and a few others from other games like Metal Slug or Samurai Showdown. Story is there and all, but it's honestly senseless, like in most crossovers. Anyway, my only gripe with this game is the resolution. Not sure why the screen looks so small in the center, but if you can't get past that like I did, it's a pretty enjoyable game. It's just crazy that there's a shoot 'em up with these characters and you actually play as them flying and shooting around. Everyone has a completely different weapon though, including the bombs and the specials. There's also several routes to follow, but you end up going through the same stages and bosses no matter who you choose. I'm not sure how great this game is because it does have its flaws. It didn't win any awards, but it's a different take on the genre. K 
can't believe it never got any attention at all considering it's an SNK crossover. By the way, the only physical version out there is the Japanese one, North America only got it digital. Europe didn't get it. Brigandine, The Legend of Runercia Remember that old Brigandine game on the PS1? Well, this is its sequel, but in terms of story, it's completely unrelated. It's a standalone game, it's a campaign RPG where you'll need to select one of the six different commanders fighting in a war over territory and resources. I say campaign because that's exactly what you do here. It isn't your regular strategy RPG. Time will pass and you'll have one phase to watch events, including most of the story and important dialogue amongst your characters. They're all in charge of small platoons of monsters that you can recruit with mana you get by defeating enemies or conquering territories. In fact, the whole point of the game is to conquer the entire continent of Runercia by defeating everybody else. Sounds like a drag, but it's not, because fortunately the enemy fight each other as well, conquering territories of their own, therefore helping you unintentionally to defeat your enemies. So in the first of the daily phases you can summon monsters with mana, move commanders around through your territories, promote units, etc. The second phase is if you order one or several units to attack, battle time. Up to three commanders can participate in battle, each with their own set of monsters. They take place in these large maps where you can move on hexagonal grids. If you take out the enemy leader, the other commanders will either retreat or fight until defeated, but usually taking out the leader ends the battle. I love this game, and it's one of the best strategy RPGs of modern times. It can be found on PS4 or Switch, although beware, the physical version on either console is rare already. Batman Returns this is a beat-em-up no one ever cared or asked for. The movie spawned several games on 8-bit and 16-bit consoles. Most people are familiar with the 16-bit console versions. Because of them and their success, the NES version went severely overlooked. Not only that, critics didn't love this one because they just kept comparing it to those versions. So by the time this was released, it was automatically outdated. Well, everyone was playing the 16-bit era while I was still enjoying the 8-bit classics on the NES. This was one of those games I got in my childhood and despite its difficulty and questionable design, I really enjoyed it. I played it dozens of times, but I only managed to beat it twice. And when you beat a really hard game on the NES when you're just a kid, you feel an euphoric sense of accomplishment. I really recommend this game, but I hope you can play it without comparing it to any other version out there. Kinetica Kinetica is a very obscure game that is exclusive to the PlayStation 2 only in North America. Ha! Five years ago it was digitally re-released on the PlayStation 4. It's an extremely fast-paced racing game that's obviously futuristic, and you won't believe who made it. Santa Monica Studios, creators of God of War. Not only that, the game's engine was also named Kinetica and was used precisely for the first two God of War games. Anyway, it's basically a competition between several races in space. These races can equip kinetic suits that basically turns them into human motorcycles. Of course, the tracks are visually stunning and are full of power-ups to make you even faster. So like I said, it's too fast but easy to control, so if you're into really quick racing games, this is a must-play. Teen Titans I cared nothing about the animated series when it came out, and I still don't nowadays. However, the game's a completely different story. I first played it on the GameCube with my nephew, and we had a blast! But one day, I got a PS2 batch with several games, this one included. It only came with the manual and the disc, sadly. The point is, this PS2 version was just as good. Not much to say about the story and characters, only that you can choose between all five of them. They play very differently, so it might be a good idea to check them all out at first. Obviously, the game has a local multiplayer mode, so playing it with somebody else was a blast. Forget about the cartoon, man. Check this game out if you like 3D beat-em-ups, as it's definitely one of the best ones I've played of its kind. Super 
Sayuki Journey West. This is a grid-based tactical RPG that's heavily inspired by one of the four classic Chinese novels, the same novel that inspired Dragon Ball Z. You will control the monk Sanso, who can be male or female, in a journey from China to India. With the help of the beast god Goku and several other characters, they will travel across several towns and get involved into all sorts of trouble. Battle maps will be small initially with a few characters involved, but as you make progress they will become more intricate and complex. It is recommended to grind whenever you can in this game, since it has some unexpected difficulty spikes. While Sanso can use healing magic and summon spells, the rest of the party can transform into powerful monsters for a short period of time. The penalty though is that there can only be one transformed character at a time. So the game plays around with the elements and the terrain somewhat often. Overcoming them is the key to success. It's a solid game with a light-hearted story, one I recommend to fellow RPG tactical lovers out there. Death Smiles Another horizontal shoot 'em up by Cave, this one starring gothic lolitas and very Halloween-esque subplots. So you can choose between them and the story changes, but they all end up going through the same stages and bosses. Music and graphics usually stand out in shoot 'em ups, and wow, this one is absolutely no exception. It gives me Tim Burton vibes here and there, overall with a very enchanting style. The gameplay is very fluid too, as it doesn't go hardcore like Akai Katana. It's definitely more balanced, but it's no walk in the park either. Controls are superb and the flow of battle while shooting feels very relaxing, but engaging at the same time. I don't care much about lowlies, but I like gothic-styled characters, so I was indeed the target audience for this game. Great shoot 'em up here, also released on PC. It's set to be released alongside its digital-only sequel by the end of the year on the PS4, Xbox One and the Switch. Closure Closure is an environmental puzzle game developed by Glial Games, an indie studio from the United States. It was pretty much a flash game until it got ports to PCs and the PlayStation 3, digital only. In the vein of Limbo, you control this weird creature in a completely black and white environment. Later, you transform into other beings. Your goal is to find the door leading to the next stage so you can move forward. You have to pick up these balls of light sometimes, otherwise you'll fall to your death in the darkness. By positioning them on some altars or switches you can go on. So it all revolves on manipulating the lighting objects to play through the game. It's very entertaining and the music is also quite interesting. Give this one a try before the PlayStation 3 store shuts down for good one day. Worms Open Warfare yeah, yeah, laugh all you want. I'm a fan of these silly games for how stupid but addictive they are. Now, Worms is a pretty famous series, but I believe some titles are underrated or even very obscure. I bet a lot of you didn't know there was one for the PSP. Actually, there's two, but I like the first one way more. It's underrated because of that, and also because I believe it's one of the best out there. I love how you can just play simple matches over and over and never get tired. I like the controls, I believe they're better than its sequel or in the one on the DS. The weapons are stupidly creative, other games have funnier weapons I admit, but I really like the ones here. You've got several voice samples for what the different types or races of worms say, even though they all look the same. I just love some of the quotes they say. In case you've never played a single Worms game, I'll explain briefly what they're about. Basically, you choose or customize a team of four Worms that you'll control in a turn-based system. You can fight against one computer team or several of them. In Open Warfare, it's three other teams. And then you select the areas you'll fight in, where all teams will battle each other until one is victorious. And that's pretty much it! They're very fun strategy games, and I think this one in particular is very underrated. Paladin's Quest Paladin's Quest is a science fiction RPG that takes place in a world devastated by an ancient evil. Same ancient evil your protagonist accidentally unseals at the top of a tower. 
he's a student, but that doesn't matter. He still has to save the world from his terrible mistake. On his journey, he'll meet several characters and fight in turn-based battles. These are played on a first-person perspective where you see all enemies in front of you, the player. Characters can attack normally or use magic spells. However, to use this, they will need to sacrifice HP. There is no MP system in this game, which makes it somewhat different than the others. You can recover HP with healing spells or with healing herbs contained in a bottle that can be refilled at towns. It's a pretty challenging game, so it's definitely not an RPG for beginners. Still, it's quite good, with some original ideas that were pretty neat for its time. Dusk Diver this is a game developed by what I think it's an indie studio from Taiwan. There's already a direct sequel to it released last year, localized on Steam just a few days ago. PS4 and Switch versions will come in February. The first one, also on the PS4, Switch and PC, is a 3D adventure beat-em-up with some small RPG elements. You play as a high school girl called Yumo on a quest to defeat the mysterious phantoms attacking the city through dimensional breaches. Later, you'll unlock other guardians from the same group she fights with. They will join your party to aid you in battle or temporarily fight alongside you. Each one of them is attached to one button of your D-pad. The controls and the skills used in them are very responsive. I've never been that good at 3D beat-em-ups, but this one I had no trouble with. It's great! You'll be fighting a bunch of enemies per stage and eventually a boss. But of course, there will be some puzzles here and there, especially in the city. Here you'll be running around to find items to unlock the next stage among other small RPG usual elements like talking to people or buying stuff. If anything, it can get somewhat cryptic sometimes when you're questing around town, but nothing game-breaking. Strongly recommended this one, especially if you like 3D beat-em-ups. Grim Grimoire I'm glad we arrived at this masterpiece, cause if we're talking about unique, this one takes the cake. It's a cross-genre game, but at its core it's a tower defense. It is the second game developed by famous company Vanillaware, although it was the first one they released. You control Lilith Blan in a quest to become a magician at a magic school. Though sooner than later, she realizes she's trapped in a loop, repeating the same five days over and over. Your goal is to find out what's going on by participating into tower defense battles with your grimoires. Each of these magical books can summon different creatures to fight, defend or gather mana, so your runes can keep summoning them. Usually missions revolve around destroying the enemy runes, defending yours or merely surviving so it spices things up to avoid being repetitive. Overall, it's a fantastic game that I wish could get a modern re-release, if at least digitally, so more people can play it. Jade Cocoon This game has been compared to Pokemon for reasons you'll clearly see today. The story follows Levant living in a small village. His goal is to take on his deceased father's footsteps to become a cocoon master. Cocoons are, well, like the Pokeballs where monsters are born so you can raise them and train them. So the village gets attacked by demons one day and so starts your quest to put an end to it all with the help of your creatures. Explorations will mostly take place in the large forests or jungles around the village, including several different ruins. It's your job to capture these monsters so that you can use them in battle against your enemies. In fact, once you get your first minions, you'll be able to directly control their turns during combat. This is bound by a classic triangle attack, with one element being strong against the other, and so on. So you see, it kinda does play very similar to a classic monster collecting and training game, but mixed with a traditional style, Jade Cocoon makes it up for a classic turn-based RPG, more so than any other Pokemon clone out there. Away! Shuffle Dungeon I first played this game when I was making the most unknown JRPGs videos on the Nintendo DS, and back then I didn't care much for it. Now that I replayed it for this video, I can't believe how bad I was missing out. This is truly a hidden gem with highly repetitive but addicting gameplay mechanics. It was also made by Mistwalker and Artoon, with a script by the man himself and music by legendary composer Nobuo Uematsu. 
just like Blue Dragon Awakened Shadow, by the way. This is an action RPG that tells the story of Sword, who doesn't remember how he came to live in this village. Away is like a curse that takes one person, well, away for each year. Just when he was about to be taken, his best friend interferes and the curse ends up taking everyone and everything away. So the goal of the game is to rescue the villagers, including your love interest, but also to restore the town itself. You do this by delving into these dungeons that take both screens of your Nintendo DS. Once you see that one of the screens is shaking, it's time to quickly move to the other one, unless you want to restart the mission from the beginning. After each dungeon, you get to fight a challenging boss in normal action sequences. You use your sword to defeat them or shoot magical bullets at them with your little companions. Man, I could go on and on about this hidden gem, but I think it's best to leave it at that. Just be sure to give it a try if you can. Shiren the Wanderer I'm not really into roguelike RPGs, I only like a few exceptions, this is one of them. It has great graphics, cool characters, interesting story, balanced gameplay and awesome controls. In other words, everything a game of its type usually doesn't have. It's part of a long time running series with several games released throughout the years. They're all connected as Shiren is the main character, but it's hard to see a connection unless you're a die-hard fan, so you don't need to play one to understand the other. Roguelike RPGs like these usually revolve around going through top-down view maps. You move one grid and so does the enemy. Same rules apply to combat, so it's basically turn-based. The brilliance of this game, however, also comes from embracing these simple rules gallantly, so it's actually a great roguelike RPG for beginners. Dark Wizard Dark Wizard is an exclusive on the Sega CD, influenced by classic Genesis strategy game Master of Monsters. Players control one of four main playable characters. Yup, each story is completely different as is the goal of the game. But all of them play around these crucial campaigns on these long-ass maps based on hexes instead of grids. The objective is to kill the boss and capture their base, although you'll first have to deal with a lot of enemies on your way. You can hire a huge variety of monsters or mercenaries, each with their own attributes, of course. These missions will take a huge amount of time, you'll be playing them sometimes for over an hour. There's also a lot of microsite content where you can send characters into towns, but it isn't that interesting. The battlefield is where the true core of the gameplay is, just remember to always protect your main character. This is an awesome game, and one of the best RPGs in this list, but beware, it isn't exactly friendly for newcomers into strategy RPGs. White Day, White Day, a labyrinth called School, something like that, it's a weird subtitle. And yes, it's a Korean survival horror game, not a Japanese one. And it takes place precisely in a school. And this is a first person survival horror game. And you're probably wondering, but Eric, you don't like any first person games. And that's right. But this, I, I like to believe it's, a, it's an exception because it really got me interested. In, it got me, you know, hooked up in the, in the game. And I believe it has some interesting mechanics because it's a little bit, it takes some small influence from games like Hog Tower or Hunting Ground, where there's a character chasing you or trying to find you and kill you. So you gotta hide often. And then there's um, a lot of puzzle making, of course, like in many survival horror games, like get this key to open the door that's all the way in the back to get the gem that fits in, in this locker and whatever. So there's a lot of puzzle solving as usual, but the gist of the game is precisely that, that it takes place in a school, you are a student and you're trying to hide from these, from these supernatural, you know, enemies or, or pretty much the natural enemies. I don't want to spoil too much because explaining what the enemies are is it's a huge spoiler in the game. So, so White Day on the PlayStation 4, it's also on mobile devices and on PC. Danganronpa, another episode, Ultra Despair Girls. The Danganronpa series is huge in Japan. If anything, all of their games are extremely popular, including the anime series. Overseas, they also enjoy some excellent ratings and mainstream success, but there's one particular game in the series that stands out for being different. You see, all the others are visual novels with puzzle elements. Ultra Despair Girls, however, is both a third-person shooter and a hack-and-slash. 
It also has the usual RPG elements in there, like equipping accessories, leveling up, talking to people, etc. But I mean, what action-adventure game nowadays doesn't have them? I played this excellent game on the Vita and it's one of the wackiest experiences I've ever had, but the writing, however bizarre the story might be, is superb. You follow the quest of Komaru and Toko trying to escape an apocalyptic city overrun by Monokuma robots. This game takes place after the events of the very first Danganronpa game and it is connected as Toko comes from there and Komaru is the sister of the main character in there. You don't, however, really need to play it to understand this one. In fact, I think watching the anime might be enough. So Komaru handles the third-person shooting, fighting with a megaphone that shoots hacking bullets and various sound bullets that affect her enemies. Switching to Toko gives you the hack and slash features, but only for a limited amount of time. Overall, this is a fantastic game, very unique, with great writing and excellent soundtrack.